not a friend like the lowly Jesus. Anybody in here remember that hymn? No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Cause Jesus knows all about our struggles. And he will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. No, not one. Nobody else can do it, no, not one. Bless you. So many hands went up, so many worries, so many, so much heaviness. And I've learned that there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry. Everything to God in prayer. Then the writer said, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. Lord, will you bless this time? Will you bless us, your people? Will you speak to us? Let every word be yours, God. We don't want anything but you. Only you are the answer to every one of our struggles, problems, questions, worries. We surrender to you in this time, God. Give this time to you and ask that you meet us as you've already been here with us. In Jesus' name, open our hearts to your word, your words, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Thank you for going with me. I was just sitting there and I couldn't get it out of my head. Couldn't get it out of my head. I don't think I've heard that song in decades at this point, but. Hallelujah. He's worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. He is worthy. And he is good. You know, there is truly so much happening in our world, in our country, in our lives. And the word speaks to it all. Aren't you glad that the Bible speaks to it all? Whoever says it's outdated, they have not read this book. They do not know. Because it is alive and it works to this day. Today we're going to be in the book of Habakkuk. What's funny is, I thought that was random. And then Pastor Paul said that last week, Lisa Harper was in Habakkuk. So maybe the Lord is telling us something as a house that we need to be paying attention to. But... The Lord, as I was preparing, took me to this book, and it's, I, I thought it was random because I don't generally go to Habakkuk. 
And when I was a kid, I called it Habakkuk. Because I was like, that sounds about right. <laughs> but it's a book, it's only three chapters. And it is tucked between another small prophetic book, Nahum, and then Zephaniah. And it's just easy to flip past. If you're flipping through, you see a lot of Jeremiah, a lot of Ezekiel, a lot of Isaiah. And then all of a sudden, you're in the New Testament, right? But here it is, a book that can still speak to us today. I am going to confess that I am someone who tends to worry. So when Pastor Paul said, who's worried about things? It's like, man, there is always something that could be on my mind and my heart, always something I'm giving to the Lord. And I think I passed it on to my eldest son, Gabriel even when he was a baby, I mean an infant, less than a year old, he would hold on to the sides of the stroller like he could steer it better than I could. <laughs> it's like, we got you, kid, you're good. <laughs> but he is one of those kids who is really smart in the sense, I have two smart children, but there's a, a prophetic gift on Gabe where he sees more of the lay of the land, if that makes sense. So at all ages, he sees farther out than most people his age. And while that's really wonderful, and I'm sure it's gonna be great in adulthood, it's gonna be great in childhood too. It's not easy to parent because that gift has things to say, and opinions, and questions. When I don't feel like answering questions, he has questions. And I mean deep ones. You can just be driving to school and it's like, so now, what's the space like between when people leave here and then they're in heaven? And it's like, I'll get back to you in seven hours after you get out of school once I go study and get some real good theology to tell the seven-year-old in seven-year-old language what's that, what that's like. It's not easy. It's a privilege, but it's not easy. And inevitably, there are times when he thinks he knows things or more things than he actually knows. And he starts to question things his father and I tell him to do like bedtime. <laughs> Every night, this kid complains about bedtime and tries to come up with a new argument as to why it's pointless. Every night, literally. And you think I'm exaggerating, but every night. Literally last night, EJ said to him, I don't want to hear you bring this up again. Bedtime is a must for everybody, right? <laughs> But he always gets to this point where he has these questions and he thinks he really knows and he's going to argue us down with his logic about why something he either should have something or should not have to do something. And I love it when he does it with his dad because his dad is also brilliant. And he always has this moment where he has to remind him who the father is and who the son is. And he'll say something like, you don't wanna to go to bed, but do you understand how your circadian rhythm regulates mitochondrial fission? <laughs> and Gabe says, I don't even know what you're talking about. That's how he'll respond. And my husband says, exactly. And since you don't know, you're gonna do what I say because I've got your bedtime under control. I, I understand everything I need to know about mitochondrial fission. He doesn't, but you know, <laughs> you know how we do as parents. But isn't that how sometimes we approach the Lord? And in this season, there is actually much that is worrisome. There is a lot going on in our homes, the things that are personal to us that maybe just your family, your loved ones, your community might know. And so what does the Lord have to say? What does the Bible have to say about days like this? Where it's hard to see the answer. It's hard to know how to feel and what to do. And we know we don't have the control. 
And here comes Habakkuk. In 2020, and similarly worrisome times, I remember it, a lot of devastation, a lot of heartbreak, a lot of division, and we just come against that in the name of Jesus. That will not happen again, amen. Definitely not in this place, because we know the Lord, right. But I, it, was, it was worrisome, and I remember calling my dad, who is one of the wisest people I know, and he is the senior bishop of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, who still has his Hebrew flashcards from seminary, precious. And so I called him and I said, Daddy, what are we gonna do? Look at what's happening, look at the world. And he said, Janice, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent. And it struck me, because if you know the Lord, that sentence stops you in your tracks. But then it took me to the book of Habakkuk. And I'm gonna read a bit of it because Habakkuk is a prophet. It's, like I said, it's only three chapters long and Habakkuk is a prophet and this prophetic book is unique in that it doesn't speak or accuse the people. Habakkuk only talks to God. He complains to God, which is the first thing that convicts me because I'm like, okay. Take those complaints to the Lord. And so this is before the Babylonian exile and things are in, uh, the, the state of things are in a moral and spiritual deterioration. And basically Habakkuk is like, Lord, how long? I'll start at chapter one, verse one. And it says, the oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw, oh Lord, how long shall I cry for help? And you will not hear or cry to you violence and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Anybody feel like destruction and violence is before you? Strife and contention arise so the law is paralyzed and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous so justice goes forth perverted. If it goes forth at all, it goes forth perverted. Anybody, can, can anybody attest to that? And so he's saying, Lord, how long will we have to be in this? And the Lord responds in verse five, he says, look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded, for I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that's another name for the Babylonians, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle swift to devour. I mean, these are scary people. They all come for violence, all their faces forward. They gather captives like sand. At kings they scoff and at rulers they laugh. They laugh at every fortress for they pile up earth and take it. Then they sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. And so basically God says, I have a plan. The plan is that the Babylonians will invade you. And now you're feeling about like Habakkuk, like, wait, what? He goes on because Habakkuk then responds like, um, are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? <laughs> we shall not die, O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment and you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. You're so holy, you can't look at wrong. You chose them? Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? We're at least not that bad. You make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler, and then he brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net, capturing people. He gathers them in his dragnet, and then he rejoices and is glad. 
Then he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to it because he realizes or thinks that it's by those nets that he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Basically, he's saying, why them? We're not as bad as them. And are you going to let them? They're horrible people, God. Horrible people doing horrible things. And you're so holy. I'm shocked. I'm shocked you would have it. And would you allow this to go on forever for wickedness to win? No matter what side you are on in your political proclivities, everybody feels like wickedness is going to win. It's worrisome, right? Is this going to go on forever? The Lord has given his answer, and the answer is not pleasing. What if the Lord told us the answer to what's going on right now is something you don't want to hear? Where would we be then with him? Would we still trust him? Would we still love him? Would we still be able to come in here and lift our hands with gratitude and tell him he's good and faithful and holy and righteous and wonderful? Would we still be able to say those things if when we said to him, how long, he answered and said, a little while longer, then it's going to get worse, and then dot, dot, dot. Is he still himself to us in that case? And so then God begins to answer him, because he says, Habakkuk says, I'm going to take my stand at the watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he's going to say to me. Because I feel like I made a pretty good case, yeah. You're holy. They're wicked. And the Lord says, the Lord answered me, he says in verse 2, chapter 2, write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, if my plan seems slow for you, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. I'm not holding it back on. Somebody needs to know God is not holding back on you in cruelty. He's not delaying, okay? It's taking the time it takes, but he's not holding back on you because he's not cruel. And then the Lord says, behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by faith. The righteous shall live by his, her faith. So he goes on to assure in the rest of ver uh, chapter two, assure Habakkuk that Babylon will get theirs in due time for certain reasons. And he outlines the five reasons and the five ways in which their evil has been offensive to him and why he is absolutely going to hold them accountable to it. And what I love about those five reasons is they're, they're not unique to Babylon, you know. <laughs> they talk about unequal scales and injustice and it ends with idolatry. But how many of us know that there have been many empires since the Assyrian Empire, which would have been in control at this point, and the Babylonian Empire that have offended the Lord in that way? It talks about slave labor, literally verbatim, talks about countries being built on slave labor. And I'm just, I'd be like, Lord, help us, spare us. We say sorry, forgive us. And we have to make sure that we, the people of God, are standing for God and God alone. But moving forward, so the last offense he outlined has to do with their idolatry. And he speaks of how foolish it is that people craft idols with their hands and then put all their faith, all their trust into those idols. The idols that can't speak, that can't move, that can't affect anything. 
And it's then that God ends with, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Those other idols, they're not alive, but me, I am here. Let all the earth keep silent before him. In other words, anything else you could trust in would be foolish because the living God sits enthroned in heaven, ruling the earth. And one's only response to that, to that God, is to live by faith. Even in worrisome times, when we get a word that we didn't really want to hear. So how do we live by faith? Well, I'm going to read a scripture to you, and I think it pretty much speaks for itself. But it's Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm going to start at verse 32. And the writer of Hebrews is talking to a community, and this community has been saved. And so he's saying, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, after you had gotten saved, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach, that's shame, public shame, and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated, for you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property. Have y'all ever read that? That this was a part of their experience as believers. And keep reading, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. I'm just going to talk about me. You, you hear it how you will. But a couple of years ago, EJ and I became home, homeowners, and it took a lot. And we're super grateful, and we were super proud. And I can't imagine that being plundered and me feeling joy attached to it. Knowing that I have a better possession and an abiding one. It really is about laying up for ourselves treasures in heaven. It's not like having possessions is a bad thing. It's about our attachment to them. And so then it goes on, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. For you have need of endurance. Lord, give us endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised for yet a little while. And the coming one will come and will not delay. And here's where he quotes Habakkuk. For these, this group of people, hundreds of years ahead, in worry sometimes, he says, but my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. Sounds like we have a choice. We have a choice as to how we're going to respond in worry sometimes. And by faith is how we respond, but how do we do that? It's clear in this passage to me that there are some things to let go of if I'm gonna live by faith. We have to realize that we have been conditioned to believe that we are entitled to things that God never promised. And I can prove it to you. Because some of the things that we feel entitled to, other people around the world wouldn't even dream of. And does that mean that God is more good to us? Is he a better God in this country than he is in another country? Is he a better God to us than he is in the poorest parts of the world? Then what makes God good? Because we attach his goodness to our circumstances. Is he still good to the people who have no food and no water? He says that he is good, so I have to believe that he is. 
And so we have to realize that, and this is for every human being on the planet. Every human being is born into a community and a society that shapes our views on life and what we come to expect, what we come to desire, right? When I, I, I went to college and seminary in Ohio, and then when EJ and I were gonna get married, I moved to New York. And I, the first time I landed in New York, I was like, I am not about this life. <laughs> Everything is close together, it's a little bit dirty, <laughs> smells a little bad. But by the time I left, my desires and my preferences all these things had been shaped by living in that community. And all of a sudden, I was like, that is a beautiful townhouse. That would be so much room. It's not. <laughs> it's not that much room. You see what I'm saying, though? What the water that we breathe in as fish, right, affects how we see life. And so we have to acknowledge when it's time to live by faith that some of these entitlements we got to let go of. Some of us are more familiar in culture and how we actually live life with the American dream than God's promises. And so we've conflated the two. And we think that God wants us to have the American dream too. I mean, it's bomb. Who wouldn't want that? It was crafted. And it doesn't mean that things are bad or ideas are bad. It's about our expectations. And I mean us, because I'm in this with you. Every toy set trained me to believe that I'm to look for the spouse, the house, and the job, and the children of my dreams. Pursuing a fantasy. And now that I'm this big age, I won't tell you what it is. <laughs> but now that I'm this big age, I realize that was Mattel's idea. Maybe that's what happens. And if the Lord sees fit for certain things to happen, then he has a purpose for it. But life crafted that way is not what God promised. And so if we're going to live by faith to hear something, maybe we don't even want to hear and worry sometimes, we've got to let go of the things we've ingested and make some room. Because those things are like Balloons that fill up the God space and they get bigger and bigger and bigger until they are idols. We live by faith by letting go. And then the other thing, this is the other point, the second one, the last, is we live by faith by looking at God. By the end of the book of Habakkuk, he shows us what it looks like to live by faith. He says in chapter three, verse 17 through 19, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail and the fields yield no food. The flock be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls. Yet, will I rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. What changed between chapter two and chapter three? Because it's still worrisome. Think about that. He's saying, Fig tree shouldn't blossom, no fruit on the vines. We have no food, right? Lifestyle is completely different. What if the Lord said, this lifestyle will be changed? How do we get to joy and rejoicing in the Lord? Well, what changed is verse three. I mean, chapter three. And it's a prayer. It's called a prayer. Even though he's been praying the whole time because he's talking to God. But this prayer was full of remembering what God has already done. 
He's talking about God as the God who was with them in the wilderness, who controlled the Nile River, the Red Sea, and the Jordan River. And he started to remember how God's arm was so powerful that even pagan nations took notice. He remembered how evil leaders of the past were held accountable by God and exposed for their wickedness. And then this remembering turned into a prophetic picture, Holy Spirit inspired of how God was going to act in similar ways in the future as to the ways he acted in the past. And anybody knows, you mess around and you start remembering what God has done, in an instant you can see God because you see who God is through what he's already done in the past. And the remembering will bring him in full view, which is, you know how many times the word remember is through the Bible? So many times, because God is like, if you can just have the discipline to remember, you'll see me afresh. You won't end that prayer with what I've done, but you'll be ending that prayer with what I'm doing and what I'm gonna do. And that is how our faith is built. You can't help but see God for who he is when you remember. And so when Habakkuk gets done looking at God, he has peace. He has resolve. He's still aware of the circumstances, but he is decided. Think about the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. At first, they were consumed with the events, the political events of the time. But when Jesus comes along and he starts to explain the scriptures, he refocuses their attention, forcing them to remember what God has already been doing through history and opening their hearts to see God more clearly. When they get to where they're going, they're so enthralled with him and how he explained the word that they ask him to stay longer. It was sitting with him and really seeing him for who they knew him to be that caused them to recognize him at last. And then their faith was encouraged. Or oh, one of my favorite stories. What about when the disciples are in the boat with Jesus and then a storm arises and Jesus is asleep and they are desperately trying to get the water out of the boat. Anytime an experienced fisherman is nervous about what's happening with the boat, get nervous, okay? Because they've been on the water before. But they're nervous and they're doing all they can and finally they go and wake Jesus up, a little bit annoyed it seems, and they say, Jesus, you're sleeping, we're about to die. And Jesus does what? He rebukes the storm, calms the seas, and then looks at them and says, where's your faith? Because remember that the very thing God says to us, remember that the very thing I've committed to doing for you since the beginning is making sense of the chaos by bringing you relief in my presence. In crisis, we forget it. But it's why Jesus is speaking to the disciples like they should have known that he would rescue them from that storm. The Lord has always commanded chaotic waters. When you read scripture and you see anything about deep, dark, chaotic waters, it's always a metaphor, right? It's a metaphor for chaotic people and groups of people, and the Lord is still in control. And he says, listen, I've always commanded chaotic waters, always though, to make room for his people to see him and find relief in him. In Genesis 1, when the waters are deep and dark, what did God do? He lifted land from it and built a beautiful garden where he would reside with us, a temple, if you will. Then he parted the Red Sea in the desert in order that in that desert they might find him and construct a moving temple because he had decided to dwell in the desert with them. He commanded the Jordan River to stop flowing from higher ground so that his people could cross into the land where he promised to be with them as long as they'd follow him. And with that kind of history, the disciples should have known that not only does God command water, that's easy, but the pinnacle of him commanding water, the whole point every time was that it makes a way for us to be in his presence. God, though, was already with them in the boat. And that's where their faith was lacking. 
He's like, not only did you not know that I can command water, you didn't realize that my presence is already here. So my question then is, where is your faith? You're not seeing me, he's saying. You're not seeing me for who I am if you're really scared in this boat with me on some water. This actually is one of my specialties. To get you to be with me and I'm here. So it is with us. They weren't believing God and it's easy for us not to believe God. We're guilty of this. When we get up in arms about what could be in this national climate, when we treat each other poorly based on how we think each other might vote, when we refuse to hear any sign but our own, reinforcing the us versus them within the body of Christ, I'm not even talking about out there, I'm talking about in here, because we've decided to take matters into our own hands when one of my sons played soccer for the first time, the first game, we're not, we're not athletic people in my family. We are music people. And so we didn't know how to prepare him. I'll give him that. But he went out there and he realized they were losing. So he grabbed his freshly new teammates, put his shoulders, arms over their shoulders and said, guys, let's make a plan. I said, your coach has your plan. Your coach has your plan. You do not need to make a plan, right? Your coach has your plan. We only need to look at him, find our resolve, get the peace that surpasses all understanding that he has to offer us miraculously. This is not a natural exchange. This is a supernatural exchange. When you start to let go of all the entitlements and you decide to look at what he's done and who he is, there you will find your faith. Because the Lord is in his holy temple. Where is your faith and where, where is our faith? Is it in a presidency? I hope not. Is it in our finances? Is it in our plans, our own plans to survive this storm? I say, I see you storm. And I say to you that my God is captain of this ship. I will not worry. I don't care what it looks like up ahead. My face will be like flint on the one who holds tomorrow. We heard about a great debate, but I say you were missing a player. The only one who can make any difference, anyhow. The one who has stilled storms with a word, calmed seas with a command, healed all kinds of diseases with just a touch. You were missing somebody. You were missing the one who created everything you see and all things you can't yet see. The one who shows up and demons flee. I tell you what. Don't worry about coming up with a plan because my God has already got it. And I'm trusting in him. The worship team can come on back up. So what do we say to these circumstances? If, are you courageous enough to say, if my lifestyle changes, if what I expected does not come to be, if things the way that I know them change, and I still know God is in control, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. God the Lord is my strength. He will make my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. It's very beautiful and poetic. But you know, deer, have some of the strongest legs in the animal kingdom because their terrain is mountainous terrain. It's uncomfortable. What did Hebrews say? It will take endurance. This is gonna take more than just willing yourself. This is gonna take more than just thinking it through. This is quite literally a supernatural exchange where we say, Lord, you take these entitlements and all of my expectations and I'm gonna look at you 
And while I look at you, I expect to be transformed from glory to glory because you said I would be. That's how he's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's doing it. We just have to position ourselves properly and then humble ourselves, which is a part of the positioning. To let go of entitlements is humbling. I personally always want things to go the way I wanted them to go. That is my personality. So I'm talking to me too. But can we trust God in the midst of worry sometimes when his answers aren't quick and they don't seem delightful? How might we still delight in him? Only you can do it for us, Lord. What's in the way of you seeing God? What's blocking your view? You know, the book actually ends with the words, to the choir master with stringed instruments. This is a song. <laughs> and it's a song meant to be sung together because this is one of those things that's better done together. How can you do this on your own? How could we? We cannot. Let's get ready to worship together. Lord, we thank you for your grace and your word and your presence and every opportunity to see you. Help us in the coming days and weeks and months to remove whatever might be blocking our view so that we might see you even more clearly than ever before. In Jesus' name.